are off. Tricks, treats, and techniques. And you have no idea the amount of effort we went into to try and alliterate to that degree. <laughs> um, I don't claim any of them are tricks. Doubt whether any of them are treats and some of them are techniques, but it made a nice start as so we did it this way. It's basically ideas. The longer you've been around in the game, you pick up these little things that work for you. Whether they're relevant to anybody else, don't know. But um, I've got some to go through. I think I've got about four. Gordon, you've got four, five, six, eight, ten, or however many. And we'll, we'll see how we go. So, um, yeah, I thought I'd put all kind of music on and everything, but actually I couldn't find anything. I didn't know how to do it. So we'll do this. My first trick technique, how can I align a scope in daylight rather than waiting until it's dark? It should really be equatorially mounted scope. How do you do it in daylight rather than waiting until it's dark where you can look at Polaris through the polar scope? Well, the first question is why would anybody want to do that? My problem is there's the scope and there's the owner. And the point is, once the scope's been built, I can't shift it. So if I build it in daylight, I can't then move it to do a polar and lined. If I wait till nighttime, those of you that have been around for some time will know I have a great propensity to drop things. Um, I think it was about two years ago this summer, I managed to drop the scope on the first outing. Um, so I had to come up with some solution on how I could align the thing in daylight. So I did what everybody does is hunt around. Somebody somewhere must have come up with ideas. I would try and find it. The ones that came out with were, first of all, to align on a part of the building that you know is in alignment with Polaris. So every time you put your scope up, you get down there and you line it to the corner of a gable end or what have you. Same sort of thing, you put marks on the pavement to align it. Um, now, whoever came up with this one doesn't have my kind of family because I've got enough bright, we'd laid the paving and within the first week I dropped a five kilogram counterweight on it and broke one of the paving slabs. So I'm certainly not gonna be able to mark the paving. But my problem is I don't have one single spot where I can actually view from because I'm surrounded by trees, street lights, garages, roofs, houses, depend on whether I want to see south or west, north and east, forget about, south or west, depends on where I actually put the scope. So every time I put it up, it's in a different position. So neither of those two works for me. The next ideas were hold a compass next to the mount and look along it and point at north, or same sort of thing. Use your phone, planetarium software, stick it on the axis, move it until it points south to the south pole, and by definition, the option should be the north pole. I tried to make a video of it just to prove the point, but you'll have to settle on a picture. You can align it, press the auto compass thing, and it shoots off the scale. Because of all the steel work and magnets and everything in the mount, it makes the compass go totally haywire. They just don't work. So for years, I was struggling ever since I got the um, tripod. In fact, even before that, when I got the C, is it C, P, C, um, the Celestron one, still had this problem of how the heck you align it in daylight. And then, I found a solution, and the solution is simple geometry. Adrian will all of a sudden light his face up and tune in. If you imagine this is a stylized version of your tripod looking plan view from above, and you've got your three legs, and the key to it is the bottom leg, if you continue it, that's your axis. So the first stage is actually to find the center point of the other two legs. And from that, you draw a line from the tip of the third leg through the bisecting the cross and point north. Show your picture, it makes it a heck of a lot easier. Okay, 
first of all, you've got to find the midpoint. You can see I've got the, does that show? I've got the northern pointer here. And the first thing you do is find a midpoint between those two legs. Now, on this example, I've marked up timber and you can just see where I've marked the center of the two legs. Other people have said you tie a loop of string around it mm -hmm. and hook it on, pull the legs apart. I found that was a bit variable, depending on exactly the temperature and everything, and also the tensile of the string. To be honest, after I've used this one several times, I found the easiest one is to use the tape measure, steel rule, and that seems to work. So the key to it is you get this length of wood, which is permanent, and then you use some device to find the midpoint between the two legs. And you make sure this points to the North Pole, the North Polaris. And you can see I've marked the cross member and I've also marked the center, which is aligned to the center here. Make sure your compass is as far away from the mount and the electrics as you possibly can. If you stick it on top of a mains cable, you're gonna to be pointed in totally the wrong direction. But if it's long enough and you put this on and you allow for magnetic north, which is actually one degree west of true north. I didn't realize until I researched this that in 2019, apparently magnetic north and true north were aligned. It was the first time in 400 years or 600 years that both the magnetic north and the true north will point in the same direction. For Amble, it's 59 minutes um, west of true north. So in my case, I use the ruler and I know 479 millimeters is my center point between two uh, legs. I've already got the line drawn on the bit of wood, but you line the wood up to the center point, keep it going, and then you make sure the compass and the center point is aligned. And if you're not using, used to use the compass, the idea is you point this to north, that is what should be on the line. And when all these are lined up to allow for magnetic north, because magnetic north is west, you have to put this east by one degree. So once the pointer lines up here to north, that's the magnetic north, and this is on my bit of wood, that will point to Polaris. And what I've found by doing this, I'm guaranteed to get it within the polar finder of it may not be actually on the circular grid, but it's actually close enough that I can use the ALT and the deck adjustment, um, the RA and deck adjustment to actually center it on the, where it should be at this point. I never have to move that setup. And given the fact it's getting on towards 50 kilograms, I couldn't move it anyway. And that's my tip, trick, whatever. Uh, the first one, how to line your scope in daylight, equatorial, and for me, it works, provided I keep it far enough away from the mount and I line the compass accurately. Okay, my point number two, how can you use mount a DLSR on an equatorial mount? And this has been, I've got to admit, it's been ongoing since Glory, it must have been 2015. Um, yeah, I think it was early point of 2015 when I got the equatorial mount. And one of the first things I wanted to do was to put a DLSR and lens, you know, one of my lenses, onto the equatorial mount. And what I discovered was the universe is split into two kinds. Kind A are the astronomers who have a certain set of standards and a certain diameter of bolt and everything. And their tubes are always cylindrical. And the other side is photographers whose tripods are a completely different standard to the astronomers. And all their tubes, like lenses, are conical. So everything that's made for astronomers is made for cylindrical tubes. Everything that's made for photographers is made for conical tubes. So I'll show you the problem. 
First thing is, um, people tell me, why don't you use the Sky Tracker? Because they're popular now and come in. And I must admit, the newer ones are getting better. One of the problems with the Sky Tracker, particularly when I started, I mean, when I started, they weren't even there, but they've come in since, is that they can only support a weight of two kilograms. Now, I know the newer ones are up to three, and you can, if you pay a fistful of money, get a one that'll support five kilograms. But when I started, it only supported two kilograms. Now, there's my array of DLSR lenses. If I measure them and say, okay, what could I use on a sky tracker that, which is a 16 millimeter fisheye? Every other one of my lenses and the camera, of course, was heavier than two kilograms. Plus, I had no room on my scope to actually mount the camera. One of the things I used to do when I had the CPC, um, which was a fork mount, what have you, because I didn't have it automated, I put the camera on the top on a shoe, look through the lens of the telescope and manually guide it. And then later on, I could use my guide camera, stick it in, and use the telescope as the guide. But on this instance, you're not going to put your, I can't put it on. And also the big lenses, the 402.8, which weigh about seven kilos, you're not actually going to put that on your telescope. There just isn't the room. And finally, I wanted to go through my eagle, which is this red thing up at the top. Oops, come on. Um, because I want all the remote control. I don't want to stand out there for four hours freezing while he's doing it. I want it to do it on so on and what have you. So that's what I kicked off with about five years ago. That wasn't mine. It wasn't in here. Oh, heart nearly died. Um, first attempt was to think, hey, I'll tell you what I could do. I could do a side by side. So I get a saddle. I put a crossbar on. I load the lens on one side, no camera because I was using it to take a picture. And the other one is the guide scope. Looked great, fantastic until you use it. And then I quickly understood why side-by-side -side solutions are only ever used on alt azimuth mounts, not equatorial. It looks great there pointing at the North Pole. You try and point it at the South Pole because these are these two are separated. You get all kinds of things. It grabs the cables, it knocks things, it's unwieldy. And of course, the mount is working on the center point of the cross. It just doesn't work. So I had to rethink. And then, uh, oh, about a year, nine months ago, I saw one website and a penny dropped. So the first thing I had to do, I just no, that's it. Sorry, I'll press one. Yeah. Penny dropped. And what I had to do was, first of all, I had the 15-inch dovetail. I had to update it to a 31-inch. So I could put the lens and camera on one side and the eagle on the other and then balance it in the middle. And by moving it in the um, saddle of the mount and by moving the eagle up and down, I could get a balance. When this thing arrived, I've never seen anything like it. I don't know if anybody's actually seen a 31 inch uh, dovetail, but flipping heck, you can see it's twice the width and twice the length. It, it weighed more than a telescope, it weighs an absolute ton. So I then faced my immediate second problem was I had to go out and find a whole load of new bolts that were photographic standard. Was it Whitworth? 25, 125th inch uh, pitch. But I had to find them three quarters of an inch because I'd only just got quarter of an inch bolts to go in the 15 inch mount. So that took a few weeks. So I finally got it all sorted. And then I had to get some form of guide scope to attach it. Now, if you think you've got your dovetail, you've put your camera and your lens on, where the heck do you put your guide scope? Um, I couldn't use the one which normally hangs off the top of the eagle because the eagle was now upside down. Wouldn't go on the camera. And if I put it on, you can get camera brackets for flash. If 
I put it on there, the lens hood would still be in the road. I tested it. I tried to balance it on the lens and what have you. And then ping, I discovered the answer. Enter Ellie from a company, three-legged thing. They're a specialist UK company that make tripods and they're all a load of total geeks. The whole website's given over to kind of heavy metal music and freaks and what have you, but they make the most fantastic tripods and little gadgets that you say, hey, why in the world didn't somebody think of that earlier? And this is Ellie. Now, officially, it looks a bit like a flash bracket. One part of it fits on the underside of the camera, the other side holds the um, flash. But Ellie's got two secrets. These two bolts can undo, and this upright extends out from the base. And secondly, you can turn the base round and do it from below and turn this round. So what happened was I could then mount Ellie onto the dovetail here, upside down, because that way I could get my three quarter inch screw in, turn the bracket around, extend it out, and this moves the whole shebang away from the camera and the dovetail. Then I managed to get an accessory. All of this is photographic standards, not astro standards. So everything fits. I got this from Warehouse Express, which is called Wex at the moment. And it literally fits onto Ellie and it has the normal tripod screw mount underneath, which you can then fit photographic stuff. The next thing I had to do was to get a small scope. And the one I got was Astro Essentials because it was 20 pound cheaper than the Zwo, Z-W-O. But it came with its own little mount that took the photographic thread. So I can join this onto the um, saddle, the saddle onto Ellie, Ellie onto the mount and a presto. I've now managed to stick it clear of the mount. And then I plug in my Star Load, Ex Starlight Express Load Star with a heck of a lot of masking tape to keep the wire in place. Because if you've ever come across these, they're pig awful trying to keep the cable actually in the back of them because they drop out left hand center. Then I hit the problem. You get it all right, everything's fine. And then of course, like any mount, what do you do? You tell it, go to this star and the star's nowhere to be seen. So what do you do? You get on your Telrad red dot, move it into position and from then on, once you've got the first star, possibly the second, you're laughing, you're accurate from then on. None of those people that have telescopes in observatories, you lucky people, will have this problem at all. But anybody who has to build your, tele your equatorial mount every single time will know that the first star is always off. And I spent many a happy night trying to find out what star was actually seeing in the image. Then I came across the last bit of the mix. There's a thing called a Blitz hot shoe, which is this bit here, which fits into the flash shoe. And then you've got a deluxe multi reticule red dot finder. In other words, a rifle sight that goes there. By getting those, and I tried to show it around, there you are, you've got the equivalent of the Telrad view to get your first on from then on, you're automated and everything's fine. So here's the complete setup. First thing was the 31 inch dovetail. Second thing was Ellie buried down there behind the guide scope. The third thing was the guide scope. The fourth thing was the red dot finder on the top. And the final one was the eagle. And that finally was the kit I wanted. And I managed to get it all together. I managed to finally get it to work. The question, $64,000 question is, does it actually work? Having gone through all this flip and effort, does it actually work? So I've got some screen grabs of Photoshop. Oh yeah, I forgot. Here's the intro to what you're gonna see. 
those of you that have been around for a bit of time will know every now and then I talk about my failures. In fact, it's normally the only thing I talk about. Well, this is number three in the series of Neil's Greatest Failures, the case of the vanishing veil. Right, this is a raw image. And if you look up at the top there, it's ISO 1600 on a 320 millimeter lens, f5.6, and I've lost it, but you'll see the 91 second photographs. Now, using the equation you've got, where you divide 600 by your focal length, and it tells you how long you can go before you get star trails. Technically, with that size lens, stars trail after two seconds. Now, here's a 90 second shot, and you'll see they haven't trailed, which is really good. And those of you that are used to astrophotography, you'll now be able to see the veil absolutely blazing out to you. For anybody who can't, it's in that yellow circle. And I, I got this set up, I thought, oh, this is really fantastic. Here we go, four more hours, or at least two hours worth of photography, and then um, darks and what have you. So I set it going, and after about a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes, came, had a look at what was happening, I thought that somebody's nicked the Veil Nebula. It was there when I began. And 15 minutes later, the stars are still there. Everything's still there. And the thing's working, but somebody's nicked the Veil. So I had to go running out, check it. And of course, you know, there's a lot of high cloud coming over. Wasn't enough to knock out the stars, but was enough to knock out the Veil Nebula. And it was only going to get worse. So I thought, oh, what the heck, I'll forget it for the night. So I went back and got the number of shots which actually had the veil in it, and I ended up with seven shots. And I thought, well, okay, I'm not going to throw them away. I'm going to have a basket stacking the seven. And that's what I got, a total of 637 seconds, f5.6, ISO 1600 on a 320 mil lens. You're not going to enter it in a competition. I'm not even going to get it printed and put on the wall. But hey, for seven 90 second shots, that's not bad. So does that setup work? Yeah, it was obviously working. If any of you aren't used to astrophotography and aren't used to seeing that rubbish picture you saw earlier, the raw picture with the veil, and it being turned to this, I just thought I'd add this at the end. Everybody's seen this. It's the uh, Pillars of Creation from Hubble. It's the first one. You know, they redid it after the 20th anniversary, I think. Uh, but this was the first one they did. And I found a site, I don't know if you know this, you can actually download the original raw negatives mm. from dozens of, um, of satellite work out there. And one of them's Hubble and you can go and get the original negatives. So I pulled down one of the negatives that actually were used in the original, the raw image that was used in the original uh, image. And this is what it was. I've actually had to stretch it, otherwise you wouldn't have seen that. It was just a black shot. But you'll notice things like the, the I would imagine cosmic rays or whatever hitting it, the blur out under, things or what have you. But by taking these, but obviously it's in monochrome, stacking them using algorithms and what have you, you end up with a pillars of creation. And here's the site mast you can go to and you can see all the um, satellites. These are all HST ones. You can download them and you can have you go at stacking them yourself and what have you. What I also found, it's really encouraging to know that even NASA and Hubble have their bad hair days. And I found this enormously encouraging to my astrophotography to know that all that, and they still have bad hair days where the big images go wrong. And obviously down the road, they can produce the pillars of creation or what have you. So that was my second one. Third point, yeah, on time. I got it into my head what I wanted to do, not only to use the DLSR attached to the lens on the mount, but having now got um, a proper astro camera, I wanted to join the astro camera to the DLSR lens so that I could be shooting at it anything from 14 mil 
up to 800 mil, which is the range of lenses I've got, whereas my uh, telescope is, was it 2.2 um, uh, meters because uh, it's uh, SCT. So easy enough, you can get an adapter from Zo and attach it, but what's the problem? Okay, I've had this problem even in the photographic world on extension tubes and stuff like that. The problem is photographic lenses have this tiny little arm, flange, call it what you want, sticks out the bottom. I don't know if you've seen this on yours, but it sticks out the end and it's sprung loaded. And what happens is in its sprung condition, it's at your maximum F number. F22, 32, 40, uh, my big zoom goes down to 40, my close-up goes to 32, most of the others go to F22. And if you push it against the spring, you can have it fully loaded. When you join the lens onto the body, the body also has a little lever and that lever pushes the arm against the spring so it's fully open. Now, you'll find, um, I can only speak about Nikon and my kit, but I've found the 80 to 400 mil zoom has a propensity to bend if you're not careful. So it's a fraction of a millimeter, but to bend this lever. And what then happens is when you put the 80, 400 mil lens on, you can't see a bat because it's just as if you pressed your depth of field preview and we're looking at it at um, F16. And the way you do it is you ever so gently bend it back out. Great for photography. However, astro cameras don't have irises. Therefore, the Zoe camera doesn't have a lever to press the arm. And there's the adapter, but there's no arm. So when you join the lens onto this and this onto the astro camera, you're viewing it at F16, well, the whole point was I wanted to be used 2.8, what have you. So the answer actually came from Zo. There was a workaround, believe it or not. I didn't invent this. This actually came from the camera manufacturer in China. That's the solution to their problems. And what you do is you take a bit and you hang it around the arm on the lens and you pull it against the spring and then either tape it with a bit of masking tape or just hold it with your finger. So the lever is fully open against uh, the spring. And then you attach the adapter and hey, it works a treat. Admittedly, the easiest is to shoot at full aperture. If you wanna shoot it down to say F8, then you just have to pull the cord about halfway along before you put the adapter on. And that works on extension tubes, lots of things where you don't have that lever to open your lens at when you touch it. And it works a treat. Now, one thing I should say on that picture, I happen to have the 24 to 70 lens on and it doesn't have a leg. All my other le uh, lenses from 70 upwards all have legs and they attach to the dovetail. If you want to use the wide angle, you can buy a little leg from Zoe that fits on the camera and supports both the lens and the camera. And that's what you attach to the dovetail. If you want to do wide angle Milky Way shots, but on the Astro camera. Okay, that's three. Yeah, I'll do one more. Right, I don't know whether this is a trick, a technique, or a tease or whatever, but um, I'm going to tread on some tools, I guarantee you, from the wider audience and everything else. I've been a photographer uh, since 1957 is when I got the first camera, the Brownie 127. Uh, through part of my life, I spent a few years as a professional photographer using 35 mil, two and a quarter square and five by four and all the rest of it. And, you know, the first time I, I did astrophotography, it was all on black and white film. And in those days, color film, Kodachrome was 25 ASA, which is the kind of ISO now. And I used to use Agfa, which was 50. 
for black and white, I used to get a, a 400 ESA black and white film and the grain was like golf balls. And once I tried an 800 and you could hardly see anything for the golf balls. And if you go anywhere on the web and I found four or five places, and this is roughly a quote from what I saw. Plus I used to have a book, a handbook of digital photography and it had said, said something like this. The beauty of digital photography over film is that you can increase the sensitive, sensitivity of the camera for each shot by raising the ISO value. The downside of it is if you do that, it increases the grain or the noise in the picture. Now, I guarantee you, every one of you have heard that and every one of you has read that somewhere. I'm gonna tell you, they're both wrong. Both of those statements are totally wrong and I'm gonna show you. Here's a set of shots, test shots I did out the upstairs window the other day. It's on, using a 400 millimeter lens, okay? And these <coughs> were taken as raw images. And if you look above the James Calvert Spencer College, you'll see there's a yellow box. I'm gonna blow that box up. So what you're gonna be looking at is the brickwork of that top corner of it. And what I did, I did a whole range, 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, and moved the ISO. And it was shot on program control and, and what have you. So this was, um, I should have, there we are. Um, this was ISO 200 in program mode. And, and there's a bit of grain, but when you think of the enlargement, it's quite massive. I'll miss out the... 400, 800, jump to 1600, and you can see there's an increase, 200, 1600, there's an increase in noise. If we jump to my last one, 6400, you'll find there's a massive amount of noise. 1600, 200. Okay. So I've just proved myself wrong that actually high ISO <laughs> does increase the noise. No, not necessarily. Since ISO value wasn't the only variable we altered in that sequence, ISO 200 under program control was taken at a two hundredth of a second at F7. 1600 was taken as six, one six hundred and fortieth of a second at F14. And finally, 6400 was taken at 1,250th of a segment F18. So let's try a different approach. We'll put the camera on manual. We'll fix the shutter speed and the F number, and we will only vary the ISO. So each ISO value I'll take, as I said, 200, 400, 816, 32, 64. And there's the range of shots that I ended up with. And predictably, the 200 is underexposed, actually by three stops, 400 by two stops, 800 by one stop, 1600 was the correct exposure, 3200 is one stop over, 6400 is over. Now, in Photoshop, you can brighten pictures without affecting noise or anything, because it's affecting the luminosity value. And it can go three stops under or two stops above if they are raw images. So what we'll do here, here is the um, 200 native. I've put it up three stops and we've got that. Do that to each of them. And now you'll find that all of them have the same luminosity on the picture. They were still taken on the same F number still taken on the same uh, speed and still taken on different ISOs, but I just rebalanced it. Now let's have that close up look. This is ISO 200, that's ISO 1600, and that's ISO 64. Change in the ISO has not altered the amount of grain, but there's something strange. If I go to this one, there's the ISO 200 in program mode, and there's the ISO 200 in manual mode. 
obviously there's far more brain noise on the manual mode than the program mode. And I'll show you something else as well. Here's the ISO 1600 on program mode and the ISO 1600 on manual mode, and the grain's identical. And it shouldn't surprise you because all of them had 164th of a second F14. So what's going on? ISO on itself does not increase the sensitivity of the sensor in the way that film with high ISO, high ISO used larger silver highlight crystals to increase the sensitivity. You cannot alter the sensitivity of the sensor without changing the sensor. The quantum efficiency, QA of the sensor is fixed. And no matter what you do in a camera, you will not alter that. The only way you can make the output different is to change the amount of photons that's actually hitting the sensor. High ISO, high ISO, ISO in program, aperture, or shutter modes reduces the light hitting on the sensor because each time the camera, when it's on its own, tries to create a gray image, 18% gray, they call it. So if you turn the amplifier, the ISO amplifier up, then the camera reduces the amount of light to equal 18% gray. In doing that, what happens is you actually reduce the signal to noise ratio of the image that comes off the sensor. And therefore your ISO amplifier only amplifies the noise. Look at the difference down the bottom here. When we did one 200th, this was 200 ASA ISO, one 200th of a second at F7 compared to the um, 6,400, one 1250 at F18, there's 12% less light in the 64 ISO than entered the camera and hit the sensor in ISO 200. If you reduce the amount of light 12 times, you're reducing the signal to noise ratio, you're increasing the noise. Okay, let's just visually say, and I took this from lowly spec to save me doing it. You've got the light source, it generates photons, the photons hit the sensor. The sensor converts the number of photons into electrons. Okay, you've got quantum efficiency and all the rest here. Out of that, it goes into an ISO amplifier, which boosts it to reflect your ISO setting and then passes it down the road. If you artificially reduce the amount of light that hits this sensor by upping the ISO value, you're actually making this amplify the noise and not the signal which comes off the sensor, which goes down the line. And therefore, on a normal picture, that's why high ISO equals lots of noise because you've reduced the amount of signal that is on the sensor. Cool. That explains normal everyday photography, but astrophotography, there's a quirk. And that is for low light photography. If you use a low ISO signal, the setting is so low that the ISO amp doesn't amplify the low light level that's coming off the sensor. And the whole output is so low at this end that it's swamped by the noise at this end. In daylight, because even though the, ISO, the amp might be amplifying the noise here, really together they produce so much signal as the swamp this lot, it really doesn't matter. But when you're doing low light astro work, compared to how little signal, remember in astrophotography, you're forking a black, you're photographing a black cat in a cold, <laughs> cold hole, you know, black on black. There's so much or there's so little signal in the upstream that the noise of the downstream actually takes control. So you end up in the most strange situation in astrophotography. If you use a low ISO, you actually increase the noise in the final image. Just to prove it, I've had to take this off 
lonely spec because basically there are all the newer cameras, DLSRs, on ISO invariant. And that means that the ISO bit is built into the sensor and it doesn't produce um, extra noise no matter what you set the value of the amp to. And although it really came into the uh, camera after mine, I can on a test bed, I tried to do it and I could tell the difference, but it wouldn't translate over Zoom. So this is Lonely Specs. And as you can see, he's taken a whole series and he stripped them on. This is on a Canon EOS 6D. When he set the ISO to 100, masses of noise, and it got less and less until finally his sweet spot was 6,400 ISO. Um, the exposure was the same. The, um, the shutter speed was the same. The F number was the same. The only thing that altered was the ISO. And this shows you that if you have got an ISO variant, slightly older camera, then by putting a high ISO instead of a low one, you actually reduce the noise. Doesn't matter what you read on the web and in books about up the ISO, you increase the noise, you don't. Now, the difficult bit is every camera has a sweet spot at a different position. Mine, for example, it gets up to 1600, and after that, the ISO amplifier is making so much noise, it takes over again and the noise starts to come back. On the Canon, it was 2400 where it started coming. Everybody should do their own test, but I guarantee you that on 1600, 3200, or if you mark and got an 850, 6400, or even 1280, somewhere around there, that's where you get the smallest amount of noise for your astrophotography using a DLSR. And that, gentlemen and ladies, is me finished. Hopefully you should all have a screen. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, good. And good for that. So I'll just click through that. Right. The, what I found is, because um, I'm fairly new to the, I'm, as you all know, I'm fairly new to this. Uh, and what I have trouble with is focusing because basically I've got cataracts and uh, problem with my eyes and doesn't see too well sometimes, especially in the dark. And I find them my actual point of focus is getting to be a damn nuisance, especially if you're trying to take photographs. So I thought I had to get a button of mask. Now, so I, I looked up for the cost of one and I could get one, uh, see how much there was, it wasn't too bad. But actually, uh, I couldn't actually get a one because uh, it was all sold out. So I thought, damn it, I'll make a one. So that's what I've done. And it's just been a cardboard. And it's stapled together, and you can see, it, and that's it fitted onto the actual scope. Now, what I'm really hoping is that this will let me. No, it's not going to let us do it. Arr, I need to come into this. How do you come into this? Hang on. Come into that and go into that. So I, I found this website. Deep Sky Watch, uh, and that explains how to make them. And if if nobody has got one, uh, even my cardboard one, iPhone, it makes such a difference. Uh, so basically, what they say is get some thin card, thin card or thin plastic. And uh, what they've got is they've got a chart, and you can pick your Pick your scope as near as you can get it. Uh, I picked eight inch F5 for my one because obviously it's an eight inch scope I've got. And I printed it out over two pages just like this, which I sellotaped together. And then I got some black card. And then I used a bit of print stick and stuck that to the black card. And then I spent a very happy hour with a sharp knife cutting all the slots out. And it soon is really boring, and uh, um, I think it'd be quite safe to say it is really boring. But it it, it didn't take too long, to be honest. And uh, I ended up with a, I ended up with a button of mask, which is 
looks like that, but not quite as smooth. <laughs> <laughs> and it works fine. Uh, so um, if anybody Gordon, wants to... Gordon, sorry, I should just say for everyone and also everybody viewing, unfortunately, your Zoom is configured to only share the PowerPoint window, All right. not your desktop. Okay. Oh, well, I, I I'll, come, I'll, come, I'll come back could. to the PowerPoint then. Yeah, I didn't know you could have that, but I discovered it on mine this afternoon. Ah. We can't see what you're uh, You can't about. see. Okay, I'll come back to oh, the other one then. You were descriptive enough that we know what you're on about. All right. There you go. Anyways, so basically uh, what I ended up with is uh, I ended up cutting it, cutting it out and then just make a, a circle of cardboard that fits on the outside tube of the telescope stick it on and uh, as you can see i've actually stapled it as well just to make sure it didn't fall off because the glue is rubbish and uh, it actually works a treat so now that i know it does actually work and i can use it i will actually be buying the proper one just so that's my first one and that's if anybody wants the uh the website that is the website there uh but to be honest i just googled the button off mask and it came up. Uh, there's loads of sites. So next, have you got a bad back? Hip stop lock when you bend down. You know what you need. You need a right angle finder for your polar scope. There you go. That's me without it. Uh, obviously, I've got a set up in the house here. And you always end up in so you like contortionist trying to look through your polar scope and I thought oh this is no good my knees was killing us I had my hip locked uh, I've got a bad back obviously so I thought I've got to do something about this and I, I looked about and sure enough you can actually find right angle uh, attachments for your polar scope and uh, there was I think there was one advertised in the sky at night just the last month and it's £125 which I thought was a bit steep, you know? So as you can see, the right angle finder fits on and it makes it so much simpler. And this is what I've got. So I went on to eBay. Oh, behave. There you go. I went on to eBay and I found a Pentax right angle finder for the princely sum of 18 pound. And they've still got loads of them. Yeah, they seem to be really, really common. And I, do, I have actually found the one advantage of this as well, and that is it actually fits my Canon camera as well, So, which is really handy. So when I get bored of it, I can put it back on the Canon. So what you need is you need one of these, and you need one of these. And I'm sure Neil will recognize this straight away. 35 millimeter Fulham tube. And what you got to do, you take the eyepiece off the Pentax finder and throw away the cap of the tube, turn it upside down and lay the, lay the finder on top. And you've got to make four holes for the screws to go through. Now, I wouldn't advise you to use a drill. <laughs> no, for the four holes anyways. What I've done was I got a hot needle. So I, I raided the wife's sewing box and I've got a darn needle. And I heat it up and I just use the candle, which is hot enough. And I got it nice and hot. And I just melted the hole through. And then what I, after I'd done that, the center hole, I, I did actually drill that out with a hole, with a, with a drill. Uh, and then you screw it in. And this is the tricky part. Getting the four screws into the four holes to screw back onto the right angle finder. But it, Took a little persuasion, say, but I managed it no problem at all. And uh, you know, what you will find is that your tube, the Fulham tube, is actually a bit too long, and you want to half it, half the length. So you just cut it, cut it off. You can actually use a sharp pair of scissors. And that, that's a terrible picture, but uh, you can see where the four screws are. They're just there, and. That's that's basically what I made, the right angle finder, and I can show you it again. Hang on, there you go. Yeah, and uh, like I said, it, it saves your back, it saves your knees, uh, it saves you being a contortionist. 
Now what I need to do is knock out the street light that's in my back garden, and I'll be able to actually use it. But I will I will be bringing it with us with uh, to try to properly when I come down to uh, Embledon. The other thing I found was how to make sure your colometer is aligned properly in the eyepiece. What I, what I found with mine, I've got a laser colometer, and if I just stick it into the eyepiece and tighten up the thumb screws, it tends to. You can uh, hopefully you can see the red dot on the on the screen of the center of the screen. Um, it's at the bottom center. That's that's the laser. That's if I just stick it straight into the into the eyepiece and tighten up the thumb screws. And depending on which thumb screws you, you tighten, that red dot could be at the top, it could be in the middle, it could be at the bottom, it could be to the right or to the left. It doesn't really matter. It's so inaccurate. So I found this I found this to be really, really annoying because here yeah, you can see this is the mirror inside the telescope. And the black circle, the little black circle with three quarters of the way up, is the center of the mirror. And you can just see the red dot below it, which is no good. What I wanted, it, uh, uh, I did it there. Uh, you now you can see the red dot is actually in the center of the circle now. And the way I done this was I took up a little bit of the slack of the tube by fitting a little bit of basking tape onto the end of the colometer. Uh, you can wrap it right round and it just, it's a nice tight fit and it stops it wiggling about. And when you tighten up the thumb screws, it doesn't move at all. And the uh, laser is dead center in your eyepiece. And then you can colometer it to your heart's content. Now, when I did get my laser colometer, I did find out one thing. I did try it and I collimated my telescope and I spent hours on it because it's the first time I'd ever done it. And I took the, took my telescope outside on a nice clear, nice clear night, which was unusual. And I found that I couldn't see a thing. The stars was all funny shapes and all sorts of things. Uh, so I thought there's something no quite right here. So I dismantled everything and brought it in the house and swore a bit and had a cup of tea. And then the next again day, I thought, there's something no right here. I don't know what it is, because I checked it again, obviously. And I, what I found out was that the columnator wasn't actually uh, columnated properly, and the laser was, wasn't central. So I had to find a way to make the, make the, laser, the laser central in the, in the columnator. So I've done a little bit of hunting about, and I've got, there you go, this is my, this is my kitchen table. Uh, what I found out was I did two right angle brackets, courtesy of B&Q, a chunk of wood, basically a chunk of wood, and a cramp just to stop it sliding about in the table. And you can see the column that just lies nicely in the right angle bracket. Now you can, what you can do now is you can actually turn the column there clockwise or anti-clockwise and it's changed the red light on your wall. And you obviously stick a bit of paper on your wall. Don't, uh, don't use an ink pen to mark your wallpaper, please, or your paint. Uh, you, you get complaints off your wife, I've discovered. Uh, but anyways, so put it on, switch, switch the column there on, mark the red dot on the wall, then turn the colometer 180 degrees. And if you're really lucky, the colometer red dot will never move off that spot. If, like me, you're unlucky, you'll find it moved about half an inch. So I then thought, oh, God. <laughs> what the hell am I going to do with this? So what I did find out was that there's three screws in this, and they're filled up with mastic. So you had to get a little needle and just pull the mastic out. And inside that little hole is Allen keys. And the Allen keys, there you go, are the ones that you use to adjust, much the same as you adjust the mirror on your, uh, on your telescope. 
And by slapping them one, tightening the other, you move the little laser around the boat a little bit. And it, I, I will say one thing. It's m fractions of an inch you have to turn these it's, uh, to, to get the laser to move. And it took me the best part of two hours one night to get the to get my cal uh, collimated properly, but once I got it done, and I put it back onto the uh, back onto the thing and collimated my telescope, it was actually smack on. And no, no, if I put my collimator into my eyepiece of my telescope, and it's central, it hits the center of the mirror, bang on the center. And I can take it out, turn it 180 degrees, and put it back in again, and it's still hitting 180 degrees. Uh, it's still hitting smack in the center of the mirror. So I know it is absolutely bang on. So that's that was a little trick if anybody is having problems with a commenters. The other thing I had was uh, I haven't got this problem now because somebody bought me a lovely new Lyithon uh, battery for my for my uh, telescope. But before that, I did actually just use a jump starter battery. And what I found out was when it was fully charged, it was at 14 volts, and then rapidly dropped down to 12, and then rapidly dropped down to 11, 10, 9, 8, which is no good at all. So I thought, well, this is no good. I must be able to find a way to do something with this. So I've done a little bit of reading up on it. And apparently, you can buy a thing called a bug board. Now, I'd never, ever heard of these apart from the fact that they used to be on um, horse wagons. And that's what you rested your feet on. So anyways, the updated buckboard is a bit of electronics. There you go. And it comes as a bare board. So I've put mine in an old plastic screw box uh, and seal the holes up with mastic. And what you can do is just get your ordinary cable, cut it in half, bear the wires, they go, uh, well, you can see where it says in, that's the, uh, obviously that's your input, and where it says out is your output, and uh, you can, uh, when, you, when you plug it in, if you see there's a button marked in out, if you press that button until it says in on the digital display, it tells you the voltage of the battery coming in. This one is at 12.84 because it's still fully charged, right? Now, if you press the button again it'll, to out, it changes, it changes it. And I've got it set at 12 and a quarter volts because the minimum voltage for your uh, equatorial mount is 12 volts. So I'll give it an extra quarter of volt just, to, just for that. And this doubled the length the, of the time the battery, the uh, will run my mount just by doing that. Uh, when it's fully charged and it's, it's chucking out 14 volts, it slows it slows the power down. And it's uh, actually doubled the time that I can use it. But like I said, I don't use it at all now. So if anyone wants to try one, and they don't want to buy one, they can borrow this one to try it. There you go. I thought that, that might be a bit of a handy tip for anybody. Like I was saying, these boards come with no instructions at all. <laughs> you have to work it out for yourself. <laughs> it's great fun. Uh, if you want to alter the voltage, you'll see there's two little brass screws, CC and CU. The CC alters the voltage coming in, supposedly. I can't get that to work. It just seems to be whatever voltage is coming in, it's coming in. But the CU one, that does actually alter the voltage going out. So you can you can change that down to 9 volts, 8 volts. Uh, this, this board works down to 5 volts, and it will work up to 30 volts coming in. So you can actually have a 30 volt battery coming in and a 5 volt power going out. Uh, there's all different kinds of boards, so you've got to watch what kind you're buying. Uh, some of them are 12 volts, some are 15, some are, like I'm saying, this one's a 30. And they don't cost a lot. This one costs £7. You know, so that 
they're cheap. On on Amazon, you can they're selling them as packs of four and six for like ten pound. You know, so if you shop about, you can pick them up fairly easy. You know, and uh, now I'm afraid that's about uh, that's about my lot. I don't have a lot more to say. So as to say, the end. <laughs>